to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, aloha from Waikiki Beach. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. You know, I live right on the beach here in Waikiki. I live on the land that Queen Lilio Kalani lived on. And there's a beach, there's a surf spot right out in front of my house called Queens. It's where she used to surf. And what an honor to live here where royalty lived, the king and queens of, uh, of Hawaii. And one of the things that Queen Lilio Kalani stood for was a noble humility um, and aloha. In Hawaii, aloha means to give breath. Ha means breath. And aloha, basically, it means love. And so when we greet each other, man, I'll tell you, I go for a walk down the beach or I can hardly walk because everyone comes up and greets with a smile and a hug. Uh, occasionally, the men will touch foreheads and, and breathe their breath. And the women will come up and give you a little uh, her cheek right against your cheek and breathe. That's the Hawaiian ha of aloha. But the other day, I was out at Queen's Break, this spot here in, in, in Hawaii, right in front of my house. I mentioned this last show. And there's a bully in the water. He's been a bully for as long as, for 20 years, he's bullied tourists, bullied people. Uh, he even hassled my son when he was uh, came home from Afghanistan from the war. And my son has surfed 85-foot waves, but he's a humble guy. And, when this guy. and all Jeremiah wanted to do was just go out and have a beautiful surf. And, and he bullied him right out of the water. He's taken runs at my wife and I on, the, on our boards. And I've had to back him down a couple of times, but this time I just kind of got fed up with it. Now, a couple of times when we've had our world title here and all my tandem teams show up, then he, gets, he kind of freaks out. So I went out, I went out of the water purposely to, purposely to shame him. I got into the lineup and I yelled at him and said, hey, Everybody, there's a world-famous surfer here. Everywhere I surf, whether it's Australia or France or Spain or, or uh, um, anywhere in the world, Israel, anywhere I've surfed, they know about, they know you. You're famous because you're a bully and you're a punk. And I just kept saying that loudly. And then he started yelling at me. I said, well, you know, um, I don't like to argue. Let's go to the beach and fight. So we went to the beach. And when we got to the beach, I had such a big surprise for him. I had planned this all out. About three feet of water where you really can't fight. I started yelling to about 150 of the tourists on the beach. There's almost like a little, um, a little um, stadium almost. Hey, you guys, there's a world-famous surfer here. He is so famous everywhere I go around the, around the world. He bullies people, and, and he's, he's not respected. He's hated everywhere because he bullies tourists. You know, you might, have a, you might be a big, beefy football player, but in the ocean a quarter of a mile out, you're not going to be an equal to anyone who knows how to surf, and he just bullies everybody. Uh, and, and and even uh, you know even the, even uh, my wife on our, when we're tandem surfing. So I publicly humiliated him. He came up and I uh, was hoping that he would take a swing at me because I'm not going to swing first. But he didn't. Uh, he got in my space and I gave him a big shove and then he, he paddled out just as the police came. But I'm telling you, I'm I'm at the state in my life where I'm sick and tired of bullies. And the biggest bully I know is the secular society that wants to bully Christians into submission. Don't tell us your absolute values. Don't tell us there's a God. Don't tell us, you know, that there's uh, that abortion is wrong. Don't tell us about free speech. Everybody gets to have free speech except for you. It reminds me of the mob of the French Revolution, of the Bolshevik Revolution, of, the, of Nazi Germany. Mob mentality. Shut everybody up and don't speak. I'm tired of Christians who always go back to the the Saint Francis. Well, Saint Francis said, uh, "What when the when the younger uh, monk said, what are we when, where, what are we going to tell everybody?'" He said, "Well, we will uh, we're going to go into the town and we only will speak if the words are necessary. You know, let our actions speak louder than words." But I'm sick of people using that as an excuse not to speak out. And I have a man with us today, Nicholas Salvatore Diorio, from <laughs> New York, who's here. Hey who I met at the Napa Institute, and he steps up to the plate and uh, stands for Thomistic Natural Law, stands for the Seven Virtues. He's a, he's a, he's a high school teacher, teaches young men um, at LaSalle. Um, I'm sorry, time to put my, my glasses on. At LaSalle Academy in New York. And are you tired of, of people, Nicholas, not speaking up when, 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 when truth is being just uh, knocked down. Well, Bear, before we get into that, I just want to say how it's a pleasure to be here with you. And 
Uh, it's just a joy to be part of your ministry today. And I'm so grateful that we had this time together and I'm just really looking forward to our conversation. Um, you know, the thing that frust- frustrates me the most is, you know, I'm in front of these 350 men every day um, and I just see how they feel like everything they want to feel, everything they want to say about the truth just gets put into this little box and they feel like their masculinity, their manhood is taken because the culture is imposing upon them what they should feel, what, should, what they should think. And when I get in the classroom with these guys, when I, you know, I've got 25, 30 students in a class and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with the teachings of the church, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of the moral law, because everything else on the outside is telling them to reject those things. And so when you talk about being a bully, that's exactly what happens in society. And, and we see this in, in the culture. We see this every week or two. There's another example of someone who tries to exemplify and live out the virtues, and the society crushes them and says, no, this is what we say about gender. This is what we're saying about life. And then they come into my classroom and I have to deal with all the scar tissue. I have to triage these students and say, look, you might be hearing this from the person out on the street. You might be watching a a TV show or a news show, or you might be on social media and they're giving you this, this nonsense, this garbage. And then they come into my classroom and I have to reject it for them. I have to give them the arrows. I have to give them the weapons to when they go, when they go back out into the culture they're telling them the truth about what these issues are all about. And I feel like for me, it's a pleasure. I, I enjoy being in the midst of that battle because, you know, the, my life, the last 15, 20 years of my life, I've spent trying to build and create a culture around me that exemplifies the virtues. And I feel, feel like the best thing I can do as a teacher is to educate these young guys and tell them, look, whatever, whatever is being spouted out by the latest talking head, is something that you need to question. You need you need to push back on it, especially and in the for me, in, in front for of me, your that's school. What it's all about. Yeah, and you're so often this, the teachers themselves are pushing. You know what? I want to tell you something. Uh, when I when this event happened on the beach, where I, I was so it felt so good. I felt like John the Baptist when I was out in the ocean. <laughs> hey, everybody! There's a world famous surfer here. He's a world famous bully. And then when yes. I coaxed him and goaded him to get to the beach with me, and I yelled, I was doing my John the Baptist imitation. It felt so good. Yeah, and afterwards it was like my wife said, "Well, and another friend, well, you know, are you all tense and stuff now?" No, I never felt better in my life, you know. And I tell you what, yes. that guy isn't going to be. I, I'm not even going to think of him again, you know. Yes. Hardly comes up except for when I say the prayer in most need of thy mercy. When I pray the rosary, I'll put his name yes. in there. But for him, he's going to be chewing on that for the rest of his life. If that happened to him, he had publicly shamed people, and now he was publicly shamed. But I want to tell you guys, when you speak the truth, you're going to feel great. Yes. Don't be afraid yes. uh, to speak the truth. The minute you unleash that lion, I believe as St. Augustine said, the lion, the truth is like a lion. Just speak it, and it'll take care of itself. When you let that riot, lion roar, when you speak yes. the truth with clarity, uh, and you can, uh, you're going to feel fantastic. Don't just sit there and take the bullying anymore. Well, I think for me, every time I go into a classroom or whenever I'm out with friends, you just got to let the Holy Spirit work through you. I, I can't tell you, I, you know, I've been teaching for four years now. And every time I walk into a classroom, there's still that just that unsettled feeling of what's going to happen today. What's what's the adventure of the next 50 minutes in the classroom? And every time when I when I welcome the Holy Spirit into that, he does amazing things. And I feel like we have to do that every time we step out of our apartment or every time we, we walk out into the street. We just have to welcome the Holy Spirit to be with us because we don't know what's going to happen. And if we're prepared and if the Holy Spirit is with us and we welcome him into it, as you said, it's going to be a great experience no matter what happens. It's liberating. I mean, I'd love to take it. I would like, I, I mean, it's liberating to speak yes. the truth. It feels yes. so great out in the public forum to speak the truth. And But to do that, uh, we need to be well-formed. That's right. Uh, you know, I, I teach an Ocean Sunrise Catechism every morning around 7.30 in the morning, wherever I happen to be in the world. So it may not be 7.30 in the morning your time all the time, but <laughs> but I, I but we're we're about 80% through the catechism now, and it, it's been, we're well into our third year. Uh, but it, it, it helps their people form 
they're, they, they have a gut instinct that seems right, but it helps them form their conscience and form their understanding of, of, of church teaching on doctrine and morality. We're talking with a guy I've been really looking forward to have on my show for almost a year now, Nicholas DiOrio. He is uh, he's a teacher at LaSalle Academy in New York, but he's a lot more than that. You, wait, you know, his background is pretty heavy. Uh, Fordham University, Master of Arts, Philosophical and Philosophy, and the same at Providence College, a bachelor uh, in philosophy. So, um, and he's uh, he even ran for Congress, right? I think he ran for Congress at one point. So he's willing to stand up in the public square and speak the, speak the truth. We're talking with our, our friend Nicholas Salvatore Diorio. This is the Bear <laughs> Wozniak adventure. Um, we're going to be right back with more, with more, but I want to invite you guys, go to deepadventure.com and subscribe to our email because if you do, we will email you our radio shows in a video version uh, before they're even aired on the worldwide EWTN network. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha from Waikiki Beach. In a little bit, I get to paddle out. I've got a new, uh, you know, you always want to try something new. And, you know, I, I love surfing. I love stand-up surfing. I love snorkeling, scuba diving, spearfishing, sailing. I love uh, a tandem surfing with my wife where I hold her over my head. But I'm trying a new thing, and I'm going to look really stupid at it. I've been working at it a little bit. I just got a, a hopefully a board that will work for me better. It's called hydrofoiling. It's where you catch a wave, and then the fin down below you is like a wing and it lifts you about two and a half feet out of the water and you're just surfing suspended in air. And uh, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to look like a fool and I'm going to look like a fool for at least a month. But before I'm done, before a month is up, I'm going to have at least gotten good enough to be able to hydrofoil surf. If you're not looking like a fool, if you're not trying something new that you're going to fail at, then you're living inside your comfort zone. And so I want to challenge all of you, especially you men, you have an apostolate within your home. You take, you, you're leading your family, blessing them. You're getting up a half hour early and praying. You're praying at least an hour a day. You're taking them to church. Awesome. You're doing the stuff. Now I'm going to challenge you to do one thing further. If you're not involved in an apostolate right now, then do something. And I think one of the most effective things you can do is if you're not part of a men's group, like even a small group of guys, six, seven, ten guys that get together once a week or once every couple of weeks over coffee or a beer, uh, start a group. Start a, a little men's uh, cell group. We have a, an organ. We have something really. I think Holy Spirit just kind of made this happen. We have a group called Bears Man Cave, and you cannot. It's only for men. It's a secret Facebook group. You cannot join by asking us to by going there to Facebook. Uh, we will ignore that request. You need to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and say, I want to join Bear's Man Cave. There's a way you can do that. It costs you $10 a month, uh, which, is, uh, which is right away saying we want you to make a commitment. And then you get access to our secret Facebook group. And the men there... Uh, we challenge each other. We equip each other. We we share with each other the challenges we're having. We ask each other for prayer, and then every two to three weeks we have a Zoom video chat meetup. It's an easy little software program we send you, and then we sit and we all look at each other. And we have a shot of whiskey, a cigar. We go through uh, my book, Deep Adventure: The Way of Heroic Virtue, and what we're doing in that Zoom video chat meetup is we're modeling what you can do to start your own men group. You can, ha you, can, you can start a men's group like that. Several of the men have started it on the deck of their porch. Some of them meet with men for breakfast. Another uh, man st uh, set up a video chat of his own with his family around the country, and once every couple of weeks they get together, and they don't talk about politics. They don't talk about sports. Uh, they, they, they talk about um, – they go through a, a particular – a um, book, maybe one of mine or maybe Man Up by Father Larry Richards or something. But if you're a man and you are working within your family and you're delivering, you're taking care of your family, but you're not part of an apostolate yet that's growing in, in, in evangelization, why not start your own men's group? And why not go to Bear's Man Cave? Go to deepadventure.com, join the man cave, and we'll help you get started. We have so many programs we can send you to. Uh, uh, just come to us and, and join our group, and we'll begin to. All the men will encourage you because it, none of us knew what we were doing. We're all basically buffoons. We're all knuckle draggers. We're all Neanderthals. But somehow God is using us in ministry, and we have someone with us today, Nicholas Salvatore Diorio, who I met at the Napi Institute uh, almost a year ago. I've been wanting to get on my show for a long time. He's a teacher at LaSalle Academy in New York. Aloha, good to have you back. Oh. 
Aloha, Bear. It's great to be here. Yeah, for our next segment. So, Nicholas, um, you're 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 a teacher at LaSalle Academy, but you say you are also part of a couple of men's groups. Yeah, I think I would I'd love to get into each one a little bit, but I think what what guys have to realize, what they have to acknowledge, is that when you spend time in a brotherhood, when you spend time in a fraternal group, you're gonna go back to your other parts, the other parts of your life in a more effective, more cohesive way. Because when we sh- have a genuine bond with other guys, when we share what's happening in our life and we receive what's going on in theirs, it allows us to be, first of all, deeper in gratitude, which is very important for a guy. And it allows us to be more present to our spouse, to our children, to our coworkers. And if you're not in a men's group, it's hard to actively engage in that because as guys, you know, we're taught that we got to do everything on our own. You know, we're taught that if you need help, you're in a bad place or you're weak. The reality is, as guys, we we're wounded warriors. And as wounded warriors, we need people to join up with us so that we can go through life together. And here in New York, there's more than a few that I'm a part of. You know, it's funny. Uh, every week I'm doing something with a different men's group. And my wife just loves it because she knows that when I come back to her, when I come back after a few hours with the guys, I'm just a more joyous, more energetic person because I'm just so grateful for that relationship, right? I, I come home and I'm, I'm with my beautiful bride and she just appreciates how much time I'm spending on myself, right? But she it, but knows it, that. But it's tough when you when you go to these meetings because everybody there is perfect, you know? <laughs> and then you show up like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm one of those, you know, uh, I've had this challenge. You know, men, men will open up. I have a challenge with my pornography. I, 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 I'm, I'm in, a, I'm having an affair. I need to get. Uh, how do I get? How do I make that right? Uh, my children aren't speaking to me. Not, we're all bozos on the same bus. You know, we all, we all, uh, right. we get together and realize I don't have to act. Even, oh, these are Christian men. They're all perfect. No, they're they're all foilable, and we need each other's help to you know encourage and challenge each other. Well, and here's the danger with young people, right? One of the things that young people have to acknowledge and have to really gr- grapple with is when they go on a Facebook and they go on an Instagram or Snapchat, they see the the whitewashed version of their friends, right? Because no one no one wants to post information or no one wants to post a life moment that's that's sad or that has some kind of sorrow attached to it. They only post the good stuff. And so when I go to my friend's Facebook page or when a student, you know, they visit their Instagram account, all they're seeing is the good stuff. And so then they look back at their life and they say, wow, you know, I'm going through so many things that are hard. You know, John Smith or my friend George, he's having a tough time with it and, or he's having a great life. I'm having a tough time. What's going on with me? And they just get this false sense of reality. And that's why we need real relationships, because only in real friendship can you get to know the whole person. And that's, for me, the danger that I think a lot of young people face is they're just given this false reality about what's happening in the lives of their friends. And that's a big danger. That's a big danger for them. And that I think the, the young men in school, at least they're around. I mean, so many men that I know of are, are so isolated yes. you know, from other men. They they yes. won't they talk about sports and politics, but they're so isolated they won't share what they won't talk about what's really going on with them. And I tell men, you know, we we talk about uh, you know Nehemiah, you know, re- restoring the breach in the walls of Jerusalem, how it was restored by one family at a time, a man and his family, man and his family, the domestic church, the the, the Nehemiah, the first several chapters just goes all the way around in circular way saying which man in his family built, built up what, which part of that church. But I'm telling you, man, the breach in the wall runs right through your living room. It's not yes. out there in society. It's right there in your house, and you need to stand in the breach there. And how will you do that if, uh, unless you have a band of brothers who can say, I've been there, I've done that, I, 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 this, this didn't work, this did work, who will pray with you? You know, when they were rebuilding the wall, there'd be one man working, and another man would be holding a spear and a shield to protect him while he worked. We need That's to right. be that for each other. We need to be that for each other. We need to we need to stand with each other. So, Nick, one of the things you do with with uh, so if you're not part of a group, get in touch with us, women. If you're listening to this, grab your husband and say, "You go to this website, deepadventure.com, <laughs> and you sign up in the Bears Man Cave, and let's get rolling. Let's let's take our our family to a higher level." But uh, so if you're not involved in an apostolate, why not? 
If there's not a men's group in your church, it's your fault. Let's get let's get let's 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 not be posers and let's let's get up and let's take accountability and let's let's do something for the Lord. Let's change our our family's trajectory and our society's, you know, the the, the social story that we're living. So Nick, we're going to take a break here in a couple moments, but it, uh, when we uh, when we talk when you talk to the young people, you said one of the things you really focus on is the virtues. Can you just tell us uh, not going to detail what are the seven classic virtues that we as Catholics talk about? All right, no, it's it's the most important question we can ask ourselves in this day and age. So there are seven cardinal, excuse me, four cardinal virtues and three theological virtues. Let's start with the natural virtues because that's where everyone needs to be, no matter whether they're Christian or not. The four cardinal virtues, or the natural virtues, are prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And what are the three so, theological virtues? The three theological virtues, when, we infuse, when we're infused with the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the sacraments, we receive the three theological virtues there, faith, hope, and charity. We're talking and, to Nicholas uh, Diorio. we got to take a break here, Nick. We're talking to Nicholas Diorio. Um, this is Bear Wozniak of the Bear Wozniak Adventure, and we're, we're about to really get into this area of the seven virtues because I, I think men, they want traction in their lives, and nothing will give you traction yes. more than to understand and get gritty enough to begin to pursue the virtues. We want to invite you to please go to our Bear Wozniak YouTube, and you can actually watch uh, the video version. This is heard by millions of people on, on EW10 Network and across podcasts, but you can actually watch the video version of this. If you go to Bear Wozniak and hit the subscribe button, you can watch these uh, our, our weekly show. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I remember when my ministry was first beginning, I was talking with a guy whose name is impossible to pronounce, but I'm going to try it. Jamie Derzelpolsky. He lives in Tampa. He's on the Catholic uh, Christian rock station there. And I said, we were praying. I said, man, I just had this kind of image come to me uh, where my outreach would be. that I want to meet, I need to reach out to the guy driving the black pickup truck. I said, you know, men are driving around in their pickup trucks, uh, but there's no weightiness. There's no tools in the back of that truck. So I saw. I was thinking of this truck driving through gravel and just spinning its wheels because there was no weightiness of purpose and and uh, skills, you know, tools for for him to live his life. So he's just spinning his wheels, and uh, that's the guy I want to reach. I want to meet the, reach the guy in the black pickup truck. Well, and and try to give him the toolbox to weigh down that the so he can get some traction in his life. And about two days later, I was surfing in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And I see a guy in this black pickup truck drive through the parking lot, and he had that big aluminum toolbox in the back or whatever it's made out of. And uh, I go, man, that's it. That's what I was talking about the other day, that black pickup truck. I was telling my friend Dennis. It was just like that. He's driving through. He's got a lot of weight in the back of that truck. You know, he's not spinning his wheels. And then as he left, he rolled down the back window, and a wild bobcat stuck his head out. And, I, and, and then it came to me. The most, and th this is the creed of our ministry. The most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. God has a wild adventure for you. Men are made from mud, right? God formed us out of mud. We need to get gritty and we need to get real with each other, and, but we need the tools. And that's when I began to focus on the seven virtues. You know, I wrote the book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. Autographed copies are available at our website, deepadventure.com, or you can go to Amazon if you like. But we have with us someone else, else who really believes in the seven virtues. We've talked. We, you mentioned them briefly. Why don't we break down? Let's break it down now. The four cardinal virtues, which Aristotle, Socrates, Plato talked about, cardinal meaning cardus, meaning like the door of a hinge, right? Yes. Um, yes. Or others say that cardinal compass points north. You know, it, it's like a compass too. Can you tell us what uh, what justice is? So justice really is owing to one another what they're due, right? Owing to the person that your neighbor's with, owing to your fellow human being, what's due to them. And as our friend Jason Jones would talk about, all human beings, every person has an inherent dignity that allows them to be afforded what is due to them, which is a sense of justice, a sense of right order. And the trouble is in our culture, We've lost a sense of what it means to have innocence. We've lost a sense of what it means to be owed something, owed, owed a sense of justice. And I think 
you know, Jason, obviously his, his beautiful ministry is all about the child in the womb. So there's a great example of, of a human being that should be afforded a certain level of justice because of that dignity that's infused in them with their soul and their body together. So justice is all about giving to one another what's owed to them because of their inherent dignity. And we always have to remember that no matter who the person is, there's an inherent dignity there. You know, I think it's something that, that my students always confuse because this is, a, this is one of the virtues that young people are really focused on right now. They're focused on equality. They're focused on equal, treat, equal treatment. And that's great. It's great to have that sense of what justice is, but it has to always be balanced with the truth. It has to always be balanced with a sense of right order. And I think sometimes in our culture, especially now, we're losing that sense of what justice really looks like. And for me, this is a virtue that everyone can grasp onto. Everyone says, yes, justice is a good thing. I need to seek the right order to, towards somebody. But they also have to realize that along with justice comes certain ac actions. Along with justice comes certain treatment. And I think that's where sometimes the culture gets, gets lost. You know, there's a scripture verse that says, uh, love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Yes. Truth has sprung up from the earth, and of course, Jesus is truth. Love and truth have met together. They go hand in hand. If yes. you, all you have is love, you got warm, gushy feelings, and you know the poor woman. You know she's she's uh you know she's not able to support the kid, or they're gonna have, it's gonna have Down syndrome. Let's kill it. That's a nice yes. emotional feeling. I understand. In fact, people don't say kill it. Let's just let's abort it. They don't even think of it as being a bad thing because they don't have the truth. Yes. Uh, but if all you have is truth and no love, then you're just uh, – it's kind of like – to me, a human being is made out of flesh and bone, you know? So lo think of the love as, as the kind of the flesh part of the person. We give each other a hug. It feels all good. But the skeleton gives us our frame, gives us our stature. That's the truth. No one wants to be a cockroach with the skeleton on the outside and the body kind of <laughs> on the inside. If all yes. you are is truth, that's not fun. But if you approach people with love but have truth um, holding up that love and giving it structure, then you have uh, the ability to really uh, set people free. You, Peter said, be ready with a reason when people ask you, for, with a reason for your faith, with a reason. Yes. We can all give testimony, but to have a reason, you need to, you need to, be, uh, you need to learn your, your church doctrine and church moral teaching. And yeah, I mean, that, sense, that sense of truth is great. But like you said, if it's not mixed with love, it's going to feel like an anvil just coming down on a person. But in fact, that doesn't really help the person grow. So when you marry the two, it really allows them to flourish. And one of the great experiences I had in college was working with Dr. Tony Eslin, who is one of the great Dante and medieval scholars of lit English literature. And in The Fairy Queen, which is one of the great books of med medieval times, there's a character called Talus. And Talus is this, this, metal, this metal being who goes around the countryside just slaying every person who's out of order, every person who speaks against the truth. But there's no mercy and there's no sense of compassion. And I think for us as, as Christian men, we need to be both. And that, that mix of, of both is so difficult to come by because we're either told to be too gushy, we're either told to be too compassionate, or we're told to be heartless. And it really doesn't work if you don't have both together. Okay, so let's talk about this other thing, temperance. Does that yes. mean? Does that no. mean we never? No one gets to uh, have drink alcohol anymore. Is that what that means? The women's Christian well, temperance movement. Is that where we get the word temperance? Well, the the Christian temperance movement took the word temperance from Aristotle, from the Greek, the Greek men and women who really gave us this beautiful heritage. And the temperance movement, as we know, is all about not just having the right amount of something, right, the right amount of alcohol, the temperance movement took an to, to an extreme where he said, we're not going to just get have the right amount, we're going to eliminate it completely. Right, which is Aristotle and, believed in moderation, taught moderation. That's right. And I think for us, that's what we have to find out where we are, right? And, and temperance is the hardest, I think really one of the hardest virtues to understand because as an example, to, you know, someone who's going to have a drink, right? Each human being has a different moment when they become intoxicated because we're all different shapes and sizes. So temperance is one of those virtues that 
really only the person can can find and see because if you're you know if you're five foot six and you weigh 100 pounds your level of intoxication is going to change right and so when we live out when we're acting when we're when we're eating or when we're drinking or when we're having a good time every person's sense of the the right amount is going to change and that's why it's really important for us to know ourselves you know one of the great lines one of the great um uh, morals from the Greek culture is to know thyself, right? That's the great line that we receive from Greek philosophy. And that's where temperance really comes into play because you have to know yourself and know your limit. Once you go over that limit, you've got, you've drifted into immorality, you've drifted into sin. But if you know your limit, if you know where you need to be and you stay there, that's what moderation is all about. Well, you, that's can, what you can go from being tempted to being oppressed to being obsessed with something. I, I, I've learned to call that word self-mastery. because oh, really, absolutely. Because really yes. what you're saying is you're saying, like, for example, pornography. There's zero tolerance for that. Um, yes. But, but uh, physical desire is good as long as yes. it's focused in, uh, towards the nuptial union and things like that. Uh, in its right place, in its right time. Uh, that's what self mastery does for us, but the ability, you know, like David said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. When a man walks down the street, where are his eyes looking? You know, in Waikiki, right. in Waikiki, um, you know, I, I kind of, <laughs> I, I kind of have to keep looking different directions, you know. But I'm with my wife. I have only, uh, only have eyes for her when we're walking down the beach. She's so beautiful. But, but I'm just saying, self mastery is this is this ability to say, hey, all you men out there right now, you know. You're 20, 30 pounds overweight, self-mastery. Um, we, I, I challenge the men in my man cave, you know, keep your carbs, your, your sugar carbs, your, your candy carbs under 20 grams a day, under 25 grams a day. You're going to shed the weight. You're going you're gonna, to uh, feel more alert. Your joints aren't going to feel so bad. You're not going to have inflammation, and you're going to be able to fulfill your mission. So self-mastery what- comes in a lot of different areas of our lives. Oh, yeah. And what's beautiful, just take your example right there, right? The idea of being patient with yourself. God has gave, gave us this nature to allow us to be patient. We're talking with Nicholas Diorio. He's a teacher at LaSalle Academy in New York. I met him at the Napa Institute. He's friends with Jason Jones, which is kind of good. He's because he has no, I, I think that's the only friend he has is, is a Nicholas. I, look, I was talking to Jason last night and he said, watch out for bear. So. <laughs> now he's one of our best friends, one of my best friends here out, out here in Hawaii. We'll be right back with more of the bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha. This is the bear, uh, the bear Wozniak adventure. I'm your adventure guide bear Wozniak. I have a, Guest with us, Nicholas Salvatore Diorio. He's uh, currently a teacher at LaSalle Academy in New York. He works with young men. And one of the areas that Nicholas really challenges them is the area of virtue. We have justice, self-mastery, prudence, fortitude, the four cardinal virtues, and then faith, hope, and love, the three theological virtues. Um, Tell us what prudence is. That has a bad name, too. What does prudence mean? Well, uh, prudence is, is the key one because prudence is described as the queen of the virtues. And prudence is the queen of the virtues because it's all about wisdom, right? If you're a guy, if you if you play Call of Duty or if you watch any of the World War II movies, prudence is the virtue that really is an, is captured by the general, right? The general looks out onto the battlefield. He makes decisions about where to attack, where to where to retreat. Prudence is that virtue that God has given to us in our natural state to be wise and to look at a situation. And make good judgments, right? So, no. So, prudence is really the one that shapes the other three. So, prudence is something that we gain, not just when we live out the other three, but prudence is something that we gain when we when we put put it into practice. Well, prudence gets a bad rap. You know, be, people think, oh, well, yes. prudence is like I'm going to sit on the couch and I'm not going to do anything that, that that will put me in any sort of jeopardy. You don't even need prudence if that's what you're doing. That's right. Prudence is for bold people. And another yes. thing prudence is called is the charioteer of the virtues. You think of yes. the virtues, all these powerful horses, but the charioteer is controlling when should fortitude uh, come into play, you know, all the other virtues. So so prudence is, you know, like when I go to, before I fly an airplane, I do a pre-flight checklist, right? There you well, go. But flying it. an airplane is bold. It'd be stupid not to do a pre-flight checklist. So in your life, as you make decisions, and that's what life is, they say we make 80,000 decisions a day. Uh, 
start making good decisions. Look for the true good in every situation and pursue it. What is the virtue of fortitude? Well, this is so important, especially for our young people today who are are being faced with a lot of these choices. Fortitude is that that virtue. Sometimes we call it courage. But I love the word fortitude because immediately you think of a fort, right? You think of something strong. You think of something that can defend. You think of something that can protect. And that's what a young man needs to do. You know, one of the things that I always try to impart to my my young people here, my young men here, is that when they grow up, the first thing that their number one job when they're in a relationship is to protect their wife, protect their girlfriend, right? If you're a guy and you can't protect the woman you love, the woman that's in your life, you're going to be considered less than. And there's a reason for that. And that's where fortitude comes into play. Fortitude gives you that strength to go past and go into a moment that your body is telling you not to go into, fortitude overcomes that natural desire for self-preservation and it allows you to go into the fire, into the fight. And it's important to know when you need to fight or when you need to step back, but when you choose to go in, fortitude is going to help you get through it. And every one of these virtues is something we can practice. We can practice right decision-making by, by you know, every, at the beginning of every year, I write my life script for that year. I know what I'm going to do. Before I'm going to shoot another episode, a season of Long Ride Home, I have a notebook laid out of all the steps I'm going to take. Um, in every way, you can you can train. But one of the great virtues that you can train in is fortitude. Every year, I set a physical challenge for myself because I know I can train in fortitude from the outside in. So whether it's pedaling yes. my bicycle across the United States or paddling the Molokai Channel or whatever it is, um, I know by training in that, I can train from the outside in so that when a real challenge comes, like an illness in the family or, or something like that, I've built up a reservoir that says, you know, I, if I can do that, I can do anything. You know, well, what, and that's what, Lent, that's what Lent's all about, right? A yeah. lot of my students ask, you know, why do I have to give something up? Why do I have to make the sacrifice? Why do I have to fast on a Friday, right? And the reason why the church in her wisdom gives us the season of Lent is because she knows that we need to build up the strength so that when we're in a desert season, right, when, we, when we're when we forced into a desert moment in our life, we're going to be ready. So by voluntarily making these sacrifices now during Lent, it's going to, as you said, build up that reservoir of strength to know that when I get into a situation that I'm not choosing, that it's involuntary, I know that I've done it before and I can get through it now. Right. Or maybe it's voluntary, but you, you chose the battle. But, you know, yes. as soon as you walk into a desert, and I've walked up through a lot of mountains and desert and everything else, as soon as you're on the way in, you're actually on the way back out, too. You just got to yes, keep going. You right. got to put. So right. we had a, when I was training for my, you know, I have a second degree ninja black belt. When we were trained for our tests, our, our sensei would say, you can do one, anybody can do one more thing of anything. Anybody can yes. do one more of anything. Take one more step, one more paddle across. Uh, the Molokai Channel, one more pedal stroke with my bicycle, uh, one more push-up, one more crunch. We can do one more of anything, and that's that That's that. That that, that virtue of fortitude. But now, you know, we have these cigars. Uh, you know about them. You saw them at, at the Nap Institute. It's Bears, oh, it's Bears Man Cave Cigars. It's a seven-cigar sampler. Uh, the four milder blends, and they're based – it's a seven virtues. It's the Bears Man Cave <laughs> Seven Virtue Cigars. The four milder blends are the cardinal virtues. Each of the yes. each of them have a label that you have to peel off, and then inside is a saying from one of my books on that virtue. And the three theological virtue, of course, are the deeper Maduro blends. Can you go quickly with us through faith, hope, and love? So faith is really, that's where it all begins, right? Faith is a sense that God has instilled in my heart and soul through the sacraments, through baptism, the sense of knowledge of who he is. Right. And you can't talk about faith without also talking about the first three commandments. Right. The first commandment has to be acknowledging who God is, loving him, giving him worship. The second commandment's all about acknowledging his name, respecting his name, respecting who he is. And then the third commandment is to honor him by spending a day in worship. So faith is all about this sense of knowing that God is there. I, I cannot have a physical, tangible relationship with him. But it's, it's believing what cannot be seen, right? This is the beautiful line from St. Paul. Faith is the courage and the strength to believe what yet has, what not has yet been seen. And I think faith has to be part of every man's okay, life. Okay, now I want, to ask, I want to ask you this, because we're running out of time. Yeah. 
Okay, so that sounds really good, Nick. But where do you get that? I want you to tell us in the next three minutes, as if best you can, your personal conversion story, how that faith uh, came into a flame in your heart. Well, I, I've been a Catholic my whole life. You know, my mom still goes to church in the in the place where she was baptized, where her family was baptized back in Providence, Rhode Island. And but I was a Catholic who really wasn't living out his faith in high school. I just it was milk toast. It wasn't on fire. And I remember one Saturday afternoon, you know, uh, I was doing some work for my dad. Uh, we have this big house back home. We have a big fire stove. We need the firewood to get it going. And I remember I was out in the woods by myself, splitting wood, stacking the wood. And I just had this call in my heart to realize that I was going to do nothing in my life. There was going to be no success in my life if without God. He had to be in my heart through his son, Jesus. And in that moment, just the Holy Spirit came upon me, and I realized I had to go back to confession. I had to go back to the sacraments in an honest and, and open way. And the next week, I got to Mass. Before that, I went to confession. And it was really the beginning of my journey. And it was really this, this moment of transformation. You know, we, we hear this, this word metanoia, the sense of conversion. And in that moment, there was a change in my heart because I finally welcomed the Holy Spirit, not just in and as a sacrament through confirmation, but I welcomed him in, in my heart and in my in my will. And really, since that time, I've led a whole different life. And that was the moment in time when I knew that Jesus came into my life in a new way. And as Catholic men, we have to accept that part of what we do has to be a relationship through Jesus. And if we don't have that, it's not going to work. And do you experience that personal intimacy with God? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and it came to you while you were out chopping wood. Yeah, I was and, doing something. I was I was providing, in a sense, as a young boy, as a junior in high school, I was providing for my family. I was giving something back to my family, and the Lord blessed that. Right? Well, there's, there's the Lord people, blessed that time. There's people listening right now. They're saying, why don't I have that moment? Well, yes, this is that exactly. moment. This is that moment right now. God is speaking to you. With, with words, with real clarity to you right now as you're driving or wherever you're listening, God's speaking to you with real clarity right now. And you know, even in the way that it's, this is being communicated, you go, that, I, these guys have been reading my mail. Uh, they, they know what's <laughs> going on in my life. And, and, and this is your time, you know, to find a place, pull over off the road or, or wherever you are, take some time to get alone and just say, Lord Jesus, I, I, come and get me. Uh, yes. You know, I open up my heart to you. I, I don't understand you. Come and get me. And, 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 and yeah. that relationship doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? Just because you have that experience with Christ and the Holy Spirit, he's, the promise is never that it's going to be a light and easy path. The no, but it's going to, is, but I'm it's, going to be with you. But it's going to be simpler. Yes. We, we, we want a challenge. Men want a challenge. We don't want it to be easier, but we want a challenge. But we want to know why we're doing what we're doing. And when you give your life to the Lord, Wisdom starts making things simpler for you. It's more clear yes. what you need to do. You know, we're out of time, Nick. Uh, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We've been talking with Nicholas uh, Salvatore Diorio. He's a teacher at LaSalle uh, Academy. If people want to reach out to you, is there a way they can reach you, Nick? Uh, I'm here at LaSalle uh, five days a week. I love my students here. If they ever want to learn more about what we're doing here, LaSalleAcademy.org. Okay. And I'm the campus ministry here. And if you ever want to reach out, please do. Yeah, okay, and hopefully I get to talk to your students sometime about the virtues. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Until next week, uh, by the way, go to our website, deepadventure.com, and sign up for our newsletter so you can get these shows sent to you before they even air. Uh, but until next week, uh, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Oh. <laughs> You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwasnick.com.